the character of Jude. Jude is an English form of Judas, which is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Judah. The New Testament refers to at least five different people called Jude, and some scholars say there are actually eight. First, the most notable character in the New Testament with his name is Judas Iscariot, but he is not the author of Jude. Second, there is another apostle named Jude, carefully noted as not Iscariot. Third, Jesus had a brother named Judas, which is the equivalent of Jude. Fourth, Paul stayed at Judas's house in Damascus after being struck blind. That's where Ananias found him in Acts chapter nine. And fifth, there was also a Judas surnamed Barsabbas, who was a Christian living in Jerusalem. And he accompanied Barnabas and Paul back to Antioch after the Jerusalem council, also in Acts chapter 15. I'll use the term Christian quite often here because there is really not a great term for the first century persons. They were believers in Christ. So when I use that term, that's all it's referring to. Don't try to read into it beyond that. That's all I'm trying to say. The author of Jude, however, identifies himself as being the brother of James. James was also a common name, and several people in the New Testament were named James. However, it appears that this James was so well known that no other identification was needed. Everybody knew who this James was. Scholars think the only James that could have fit this description was James, the brother of Jesus, who would have been the leader of the Jerusalem Ecclesia by this time. That in turn would make Jude the brother of Jesus as well. Scholars wonder why he didn't just come right out and say that. Instead, he claims to be the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. Some scholars therefore argue that this letter is really pseudonymous, meaning that someone else wrote it and just attributed it to Jude, which would be an indication of his importance in the early Ecclesia. He was probably one of four brothers, and possibly younger than James. It is presumed that he was not a follower of Jesus during his ministry, but became a follower after some unrecorded resurrection appearances. Paul refers to the brothers of the Lord as missionaries in 1 Corinthians 9 and 5. It's unlikely that this refers to James, who was kept busy in Jerusalem leading the ecclesia. According to Paul, these brothers traveled with their wives. This would suggest that the Lord's brothers traveled throughout Palestine. And I'll pronounce this wrong. Agesippus, the second century writer, was one of the earliest writers of the Christian church. He lived at Rome at about 150 AD. He went from Palestine or Syria by way of Corinth to Rome, and he died about 189 AD. According to Asubius, a fourth century renowned Christian church historian and bishop, Agesippus was by birth a Jew. He had a story about Jude's sons, or grandsons, they couldn't quite differentiate, appearing before the emperor Domitian. Domitian was a Roman emperor from 81 to 96 AD. He was the youngest brother of Titus and of Asapian, his two predecessors on the throne, and the last member of the Flavian dynasty. But this emperor Domitian, supposedly, they're supposed that these were considered dangerous. These brothers were dangerous. But when they explained that the kingdom of Christ was a spiritual kingdom, Domitian let them go. This event was supposedly instrumental in bringing the persecutions of the Christians to a halt. And later these sons or grandsons became leaders of the Ecclesias. Scholars do not know in stone whether this is all true or not, but the dates fit. If the brother of Jesus was the true brother or true author of the book, it would be dated between 40 and 80 AD. Like several other New Testament letters, this one was written in very good Greek. Some scholars think that this challenges the brother of Jesus theory. They claim it would be possible, but unlikely, 
that a lowly Galilean would have been that proficient in written Greek. Still, if he was an avid preacher traveling throughout the region, he might have worked on improving his command of the Greek language over time. So that disputes that. And scholars really don't know whether first century peasants from that area were well versed in Greek as well as the Aramaic. There are some things about the first century that are simply just not known well enough. Nothing is known about Jude's death. The letter of Jude was one of the disputed books of the Bible canon. The links between the epistle and 2 Peter, its use of apocryphal books, and its brevity raise concern. It is one of the shortest books of the Bible, being only 25 verses long. Jude urges his readers to defend the deposit of Christ's doctrine that had been closed by the time he wrote the epistle and to remember the words of the apostle spoken somewhat before. Jude then asks his readers to recall how even the Lord saved his own people out of the land of Egypt, but he did not hesitate to destroy those who fell into unbelief, much as he punished those who fell from their original exalted status, as well as Sodom and Gomorrah. He describes in vivid terms the apostates of his day, he exhorts believers to remember the words spoken by the apostles using language used in the second epistle of Peter to answer concerns that the Lord seemed to tarry. From Jude 18, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts and to keep themselves in God's love before delivering a doxology. That's an oral expression of praise. Jude quotes directly from the book of Enoch, part of the scripture of the Ethiopian and Eretian churches, but rejected by other churches. He cites Enoch's prophecy that the Lord would come with many thousands of his saints to render judgment on the whole world. He also paraphrases in verse nine, an incident in a text that has been lost about the tempter and Michael the archangel quarreling over the body of Moses. The epistle of Jude is held as canonical in the Christian church. Conservative scholars dated between 70 and 90 AD, a little tighter period. Some scholars consider the letter pseudonymous, work written between the end of the first century and the first quarter of the second century because it references its references to the apostles and to the tradition and because of its competent Greek style. More remarkable is the evidence that by the end of the second century, Jude was widely accepted as canonical. Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and Muratorian canon considered the letter canonical. The first historical record of doubts as to the authorship are, fighting, are found in the writing of Origen of Alexandria, no surprise, who spoke of his doubts held by some, albeit, he says, not by him. Asubius classified it with the disputed writings of Antigolomenia. The letter was eventually accepted as part of the canon by the church fathers such as Athanasius and the synods of Laodicea and Carthage in 363 and 397 AD. The epistle's title is written as follows. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, as the AV version tells us. James is generally taken to mean James the Just, a prominent leader in the early Ecclesia. Not a lot is known of Jude, which would explain the apparent need to identify him by reference to his better known brother. As the brother of James the Just, it has traditionally meant Jude was also the brother of Jesus, since James is described as being the brother of Jesus. For instance, Clement of Alexandria wrote in his work comments on the epistles of Jude, that Jude, the epistle of Jude's author, was the son of Joseph and the brother of Jesus. There's also a dispute as to whether brother means someone who has the same father or mother, or a half-brother, or cousin, or more distant familiar relationship. This dispute over the true meaning of brother grew as the doctrine of the virgin birth evolved. Outside the book of Jude, a Jude is mentioned five times in the New Testament, three times as Jude the Apostle in Luke 6, Acts 1, and John 14, 
and twice as Jude, the brother of Jesus, in Matthew 13 and Mark 6. Aside from references to Judas Iscariot and Judah, the son of Jacob. Some scholars have argued that since the author of the letter has not identified himself as an apostle, and actually refers to the apostles as a third party, he cannot be identified with Jude the apostle. Others have drawn the opposite conclusion. That is, as an apostle, he would not have made a claim of apostleship on his own behalf. The epistle of Jude is brief, being only 25 verses long. It was composed as an encyclical letter. That is one that is not directed to the members of one ecclesia in particular, but is intended rather to be circulated and read in all ecclesias. The wording and syntax of this apostle in its original Greek demonstrates that the author was capable and fluent. The epistle is addressed to believers in general, and it warns them about the doctrine and certain errant teachers to whom they were exposed. The epistle's style is combative, impassioned, and rushed. Many examples of evildoers and warnings about their fates are given in rapid succession. The epistle concludes with a doxology again, which is considered to be one of the highest quality contained in the Bible. Part of Jude is very similar to 2 Peter, mainly 2 Peter chapter 2. So much so that most of the scholars agree that there is a dependence between the two. That is, either one letter is used directly in the other, or they both threw together on a common source. Because the epistle is much shorter than 2 Peter, and due to various stylistic details, some writers consider the Jude the source for the similar passage of 2 Peter. However, others argue that Jude 18 quotes 2 Peter 3 and 3 as past tense, thus they consider Jude to have come after 2 Peter. The arguments go on and on. Some scholars who consider Jude to predate 2 Peter note that the latter appears to quote the former, but omits the reference to the non-canonical books of Enoch. The epistle of Jude references at least two other books, with one being non-canonical in all churches and the other non-canonical in most churches. Verse 9 refers to a dispute between Michael the archangel and the devil about the body of Moses. Some interpreters understand this reference to be an allusion to the events described in Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2. The classical theologian Origen attributes this reference to the non-canonical assumption of Moses. According to a fellow named James Chadworth, He's the George L. Collard Professor of New Testament Language and Literature and Director of the Dead Sea Scrolls Project at Princeton Theological Seminary. Says there is no evidence the surviving book of this name ever contained any such content. Others believed it was in a lost ending. Again, a fight that goes on with no information. Verses 14 and 15 contain a direct quotation from the prophecy of 1 Enoch 1 and 9. The title Enoch, the seventh from Adam, is also sourced from 1 Enoch 60 and 1. Most commentators assume that this indicates that Jude accepted the antediluvian patriarch. Enoch is the author of the book of Enoch, which contains the same quotation. However, an alternative explanation is that Jude quotes the book of Enoch, aware that verses 14 and 50 are in fact an expansion of the words of Moses used in Deuteronomy 33 and 2. This is supported by Jude's unusual Greek statement that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesies to the false teachers. The book of Enoch is not considered canonical by most churches, although it is by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. According to Western scholars, the older sections of the book on Enoch, mainly the Book of the Watchers, dates from about 300 BC, and the last part, the Book of Parables, probably was composed around the end of the first century BC. First Enoch 1 and 9 mentioned above is part of the pseudographica, that is the spurious pseudonymous writings, especially Jewish writings ascribed to various biblical patriarchs and prophets, but composed within approximately 200 years of the birth of Jesus Christ. And it is among the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
It is accepted or generally accepted by scholars that the author of the Epistle of Jude was familiar with the Book of Enoch and was influenced in it by thought and diction because it would have been something that they had available to read at that time, even though we're not normally familiar with it. Now Jude, the reluctant letter writer. Very little is known of Jude, for in the scriptures he stands in the shadow cast by James and by Peter. He is merely known as the brother of the former, while his epistle is obviously built upon that of the latter. His name means praise, and the epistle that came from his pen teaches that there is need to contend to the praise of Yahweh. Jude is described as the brother of James, and assuming James to have been the half-brother of the Lord, we take that from Galatians 1 and 19, Jude was closely related to Jesus. Matthew chapter 13 records that among the half-brothers of the Lord was one by the name of Judas, and he was evidently the writer of the epistle. Little is known of Jude apart from the brief remark in Matthew's record and the expressions of Jude himself made in the epistle that he wrote. He was probably among the brethren of the Lord who were with him in his early ministry. If so, he was also among those who, as his ministry gathered in momentum, gradually became ashamed of Jesus. The Lord's devotion and burning zeal in regards to divine things was misunderstood by his own brethren. We're told in Psalm 69, verses 8 and 9, so much so that they tried to put him under restraint. You can read that in Mark 3 and 21 in the margin. Possibly the very familiarity of their domestic relationship bred in them a contempt for the methods that he had used and a misunderstanding of his ministry. Be that at his may, at the time when the enthusiasm of the people for Jesus was greatest, his own brethren attempted an unwarranted interference in his work, only to receive a well-merited rebuke from their elder brother. At that stage, they had apparently prevailed upon his mother to join with them in restraining him. Mary, of course, could never forget who he was and what he would become in spite of his attitudes of her other children. She kept with him until the last. But their representations to her, together with the accusations of the scribes and the Pharisees, evidently caused her to doubt her wisdom of the methods he was using. And so, at that stage, she joined with them in an attempt to reason with him to be more pliable to the suggestions of the leaders of the nation. The rest of the family, however, was hardened in their rejection of Jesus. Jesus declared in John 7 and 5, his brethren did not believe in him, which is indicative of a decline on their part since his public ministry began. The resurrection of Jesus must have therefore been particularly staggering to his unbelieving brethren. He specifically manifested himself to James, and no doubt from him, the rest of the family learned that the half-brother that they had despised was indeed the Christ. Their conversion was complete and wholehearted, and from thence onwards, they associated with the apostles evidently occupying positions of eminence in the ecclesia. James, indeed, became the dominant figure in the early Jerusalem ecclesia, acting with the full authority of an outstanding elder and leader. The slight references to the various members of the family of Joseph and Mary that are found in the Bible, and particularly those concerning James and even Joseph, suggest a certain opinionativeness a perhaps Judaistic obstinacy about them, which may have accounted for their opposition to the Lord, particularly in view of the charges of breaking the law and the Sabbath that were constantly leveled against them by the Jewish leaders. In any case, they fulfill the prophetic Masonic Psalm, which declares, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. Psalm 69 and 8. It is significant that his father's children accepted him. The opposition previously shown by the children of the Lord's mother was swept away by the fact of his resurrection. And once converted, 
their very knowledge of the law assisted them to become powerful and skillful advocates of the half-brother that they had opposed so strongly before. This is shown by the way that they expounded the law and quoted it in the epistles they wrote. What part Jude played in the opposition the Lord received from his family, we know not. Now the epistle itself, the epistle of Jude reminds us that there is a time of peace and a time of war, which he took from Ecclesiastes 3 and 8, and that we must not confuse the issues. He had been engaged in writing a treatise on the common faith, but was interrupted in his labor of love and pleasure by the spectacle of a rapid spiritual declension that was sweeping the ecclesias. Moved by the spirit, he laid aside the pen of exposition and took up that of a warning and a rebuke. He possibly completed his treatise after finishing this short letter, but it is the latter that the spirit was seen fit to retain for the guidance of succeeding generations. The result was a clear and shrill call for ecclesial contention. We do well to keep in mind that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private origination. None was of the prophet's own prompting, and this applies to this letter as well as the rest. Here then is placed on a record a message of divine indignation and yet a loving appeal for separation from all that is defiling and doomed to a certain destruction. There was no room for doubt in the minds of the recipients of the epistle as to the danger that was looming, nor as to the methods that should be adopted in dealing with the corrupting elements within the ecclesia of God, once this letter had been read. All were fully equipped to discern between good and evil. What of Jude? who had been selected to pen these uncompromising words. There was no indication that he was a naturally belligerent man. Certainly he would not have wished to pen the epistle that he did had things been left to his own choice, but they were not. This was Yahweh's message to be recorded for all who lived at the time of the end. And so Jude took up his pen and called for spiritual warfare within the Ecclesia, that a remnant might be saved from the defiling influences of false doctrines and teachings in the practice. That Jude was a warm-hearted, loving brother must not go unnoticed, for on three occasions in this short letter, he addresses his leaders as beloved, verses 3, 17, and 20. But the warmth of his love developed the heat of his indignation, and moved by the Spirit, the result was the fiery little epistle that sits before us. Therein Jude makes mention of the fact that he is the brother of James. But contrary to general exposition, we do not think that he did so out of modesty. Rather, that we believe that such was done to make this epistle more authoritative. James had a reputation that Jewish believers would have heeded. But he had been martyred about 62 AD. Peter, another voice of authority that Jude quotes, was also dead, having been executed at his thought about AD 65. The silencing of these two fathers caused the voice of scoffers to be raised in flagrant repudiation of the very things for which they had contended, as Peter had predicted that they would in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. It was left to lesser men to hold aloft the standard of the truth. Jude, the brother of James, and a student of Peter's writings, which he quotes, took up the task, identifying himself with these men, showing that his words were an endorsement of their attitude, being dictated by the same spirit and originating from the same divine author. Now, why was the epistle written? Peter had predicted the condition of moral and doctrinal corruption that would arise from within the ecclesia. That had since developed, and Jude shows how his words are being fulfilled. He takes the very terms used by Peter and applies them to the false teacher of his day. He actually makes direct reference to the prophetic warnings of Peter and calls upon his readers to heed the voice of the dead apostle. Judas seems to have written primarily for Jewish believers. This is implied, if not openly stated, 
by his constant references to the Old Testament and to the words of Enoch, which he quotes as though his readers would have been thoroughly familiar with them. The epistle of Jude attacked the false teachers in no uncertain manner. A viper might look pretty, but nonetheless, it is a very dangerous animal. And that is how Jude lays bare the issues before his brotherhood. There were vital issues at stake between the false and the true, and the challenges came from within the ecclesia, from those who are celebrating their love feasts with their brethren. The issues were those of life and death, and facts had to be stated clearly, bluntly, and without doubt. The love of Jude for his brethren shows through the very language that he uses, for he had a deep concern for their spiritual well-being. Who were these false teachers? Most commentators believe that they related to the Gnostic sect. We don't think that was really the case. The Gnostics, whose full development would come at a later period in time, would appeal to the Gentiles more than they would to the Jewish believers and would be particularly offensive to Jews while the temple was still standing. But the words of Paul to the Romans imply that there were some Jewish believers who, accepting that they had been delivered from the curse of the law, swung to the other extreme, a libertinism, and were advocating every license of action on the grounds that they had been liberated from every form of restraint. Libertinism is the libertine practices or habits of life, disregard of authority or convention in sexual or religious matters. That's the definition of that word. They claim that the flesh should be given free expression without any inhibitions. They proclaimed, let us do evil, that good may come. And let us continue in sin, that grace may abound. Romans chapters 3 and 6. This philosophy, declared Paul, is worthy of every condemnation. Paul told Timothy, the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And the apostles always showed a careful balance between those who were advocating the extreme formalism of the law and those who would turn the liberty from the curse of the law, which the gospels provided them, into mere license for an occasion of the flesh. As we're told in Galatians 5 and 13. James also made reference to the perfect law of liberty, but likewise pointed out that faith without works is dead, being alone. However, no matter from which of these groups the errors originated, the grand principle remains that when the truth is in danger from within, there is a need to put aside the more pleasant duties relating to our common salvation and to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints. The epistle of Jude constitutes a guide to that end. It is a time of the end epistle. Peter had foretold him forewarned of the trial that would develop from within the ecclesias and had declared that this would be particularly evident at the time of the end. Jude records the rapid fulfillment of the prophecy at a time when the end had arrived for the Jewish state. Though his words had specific application to the end of Judah's commonwealth, and therefore would indicate that he wrote on the very eve of the disaster of AD 70, they also have an application to these times, for we note in Peter's epistle, the crisis of AD 70 was typical of the end of Gentile times. Jude's epistle, therefore, is an epistle for today. It is significant that he treats with three main errors, all of which are referred to in verse four. The repudiation of the principle of God manifestation, false ideas concerning the atonement, and the libertinism of those who interpret liberty as a license. It is important to note that all three errors, such as are commonly advocated within the ecclesias today, there is a prevailing misunderstanding and therefore rejection of the doctrine of God manifestation. There is a failure to appreciate the significance of the atonement and there is likewise a measure of libertinism which rejects the concept of too much restraint. This last error may not be as obvious as the first two, 
but its impact can be more disastrous and will doubtfully grow. It stems from prevailing psychology, which originated from Freud, it teaches the theory that all restraint is wrong and will result in serious inhibitions in a child with dangerous consequences in future years. Children must be spoken to and never restrained. They must have principles explained to them, but never any corporeal punishment administered. This is the modern theory of child upbringing, commonly advocated today. Never before has the science of child welfare been considered in such details as in modern times. Never before has the world been so plagued with juvenile delinquency. The one is the result of the other. Yahweh's treatment of his children, consider the crisis of AD 70, is illustrative of the firm need of restraint and correction administered in love. This principle is flouted by modern psychology with the sad results seen on all hands. Let it, Christadelphian parents ever bear in mind the inspired instruction of Proverbs 12 and 20, or excuse me, Proverbs 13, verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasten him betimes. Of course, Jude is not dealing with the subject of child upbringing, but with the demands of adult believers and teachers who do not wish to be subject to restraint. Nevertheless, the principles are related. In the modern theory of psychology that the world applies to child welfare is often unconsciously introduced into ecclesial life today. A brother erring in doctrine or in practice is often granted preferential treatment at the expense of one who is trying under difficulty to maintain the standards of the truth. Many will rush to the support of a theorist who advances a theory like evolution, the time of the end heresy, and try to explain away the seriousness of that which had been advanced, but will turn with bitterness on those who recognize the danger and boldly contend for the faith, as Jude did. In Elpis Israel, page 113, <coughs> Brother Thomas wrote, the doctrine he, that is Christ, taught is distasteful to the natural mind, and by the purity of its principles and astonishing nature of its promises excites the enmity and incredulity of the flesh. Loving sin and hating righteousness, the carnal mind becomes the enemy and persecutor of those who advocate it. The enmity upon the part of the faithless is inveterate, and where they have the power, they stir up war even at the domestic hearth. If the believer will agree to be silent or to renounce his faith, there will then be peace and love, such as the world that loves its own is able to afford. But the true believers are not permitted to make any compromise of the kind. They are commanded to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. And so long as they do this, they may lay their account with tribulation of various kinds. There is a vast deal of this false peace and spurious, spurious charity in the Protestant world. Men have become traitors to Christ and betray him with their lips. They say, oh, how we love the Lord. And were he here, we would doubtlessly kiss him. But like Judas, they have colleague with his enemies and are as popular with the world and his God can possibly desire, as its God can possibly desire. Peter and Jude both indicate certain dangers that would be manifested particularly at the time of the end. The antitype of the times to which they specifically referred are with us now. We need to be on our guard. And a couple little notes and a quick little zip through review. We've already noted that Jews, Jude used the word beloved frequently, and this indicates that he was moved by feelings of the warmest love, despite the fire of his words. Another key word is terio, rendered preserved, reserved, and keep. It signifies to keep an eye upon, to watch, and by implication, to detain. Jude teaches that saints are preserved in Christ Jesus. 
that they must act to preserve that state. For those who fall from grace are reserved for judgment, and their sin is that they preserve not their first estate. In treating with the apostates, Jude shows that a forsaking of the faith will lead to a deterioration of character, which will be revealed in loose morals, corrupt thoughts, evil speaking, religious sham, and hypocritical pretense, murmurings against the righteous, boastfulness, gratification of self. On the other hand, those who keep themselves in the love of God will build upon their faith, rely on prayer, seek divine guidance, look to the future, exercise pity towards errorists, seek to save the amenable, hate evil, repose in divine help. Jude is more than a detractor. He doesn't just write a list of red flags. This is a letter that urges the young believers to earnestly contend for the faith, to fight long and hard on behalf of their Lord. The Jude tells them how to combat this attack. They are to build themselves up in faith. They are to pray in the Holy Spirit, maintain themselves in God's love, and wait for eternal life in Jesus. They are to show mercy to others. They should have mercy on those who doubt, even those who are stained by sin. They are to be rescuers, snatching some out of the fires that will come. Jude is a call to fight, but it's not like any other battle cry in history. It's a charge to delight in God and show mercy to others. This is how the Ecclesia fights valiantly for the faith, by loving God and showing mercy. The theme verse of Jude tells us, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's the second half of Jude verse three. Jude was the, or it is the seventh and last of the general epistles or letters, the writings of the apostles to the ecclesias at large. While Paul wrote to specific congregations and individuals, Peter, James, John, and Jude wrote to a broader audience across the Roman Empire. We're not sure exactly where Jude was written or even when. It was probably written close to AD 70, just before the fall. Jude's content mirrors the second and third chapters of Peter's second letter. We don't know if Peter borrowed from Jude's letter or Jude borrowed from Peter's letter, or both men were drawing from a prior discussion. Both letters, however, warn the ecclesias of two dangerous influences. First, the false teachers who would lead the people to indulge in sin. And second, the mockers who dismiss the idea of Jesus' return. One major difference between the two books is Jude's use of the apocryphal literature, that is, Jewish writings outside of the canon scriptures. Jude mentions events that aren't recorded in the Bible, such as the argument between Michael the archangel and the devil over the body of Moses, or Enoch's ancient prophecies. These examples come from the Assumption of Moses and First Enoch. Jude's intended audience was familiar with these pieces and therefore would have appreciated the reference. But Jude also relies heavily on the inspired scriptures, especially Genesis and Numbers, Jude references all sorts of Old Testament figures and events, including the exodus from Egypt <coughs> in Jude, chapter, or Jude verse 5, the generation of Israelites who died in the wilderness, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7, Cain and the son of Adam who killed his brother in verse 11, the prophet Balaam who tried to curse the Israelites in exchange for money in verse 11, Korah who rebelled against Moses and Aaron but was swallowed up by the earth, verse 11. Enoch, the descendant of Adam, an ancestor of Noah, whom God took from the earth before he died, verse 14. Jude is only one chapter long, and it's the fifth shortest book in the Bible. Third John is the shortest. Ancient writers tell us that he preached the gospel in Judea, Samaria, Idumea, Syria, Mesopotamia, and Libya. According to Vesuvius, he returned to Jerusalem in the year 62 
and assisted at the election of his brother, Simeon, as Bishop of Jerusalem. Little else is known of his life. 